the president of APALSA here at Wagner. Um, we are very excited today to have such a distinguished panel of speakers. Um, as you may have read in tonight's um, program, our speakers represent some of the finest attorneys to have graduated from Wagner Law. Um, we are very grateful that they are here today, and please join me in welcoming them here tonight. The Asian Pacific American Law Students Association and the Widener Journal of Law, Economics, and Race organized this symposium because as future attorneys, we recognize that our profession has the capacity to help people from all walks of life and that no race, gender, or creed should be discriminated when it comes to legal representation. Minorities, however, face vast uncertainty and challenges when presented with legal problems. These challenges are greatly increased due to cultural differences, language barriers, and the prospect of facing seemingly complex legal system. It is our hope through this symposium that we explore the practice of law with respect to minority clients, and as future attorneys, how we can effectively approach minority client needs and expectations during legal representation. On behalf of APASA, we hope that you enjoy our program. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Sean Maloney, co-editor of the Widener Journal of Law, Economics, and Race. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, one of the uh, most important parts of the Widener Journal of Law, Economics, and Race is to provide a forum in which we can talk about the different ways to ensure equality for all minorities within the legal process. So what we're, <clears throat> what we're hoping to do here today is to have a conversation what we can do to create an environment of inclusiveness. And um, you know, as, as clients come in, everyone's gonna have special needs. And <clears throat> one of the main things that, that we're looking do, to do here today is, is focus on what we can do to uh, better work with and communicate with clients when we have these different cultural and uh, language barriers. Um, I've been kind of instructed to keep the instruction or the uh, introduction short to each one of our attorneys here today, but um, I'll start off with Rahat Babar. Um, he is uh, Deputy Attorney General in New Jersey. He handles a lot of the uh, civil defense claims. Um, he's also very active doing pro bono work and is uh, an advisory board member for the Widener Journal of Law, Economics, and Race, and a uh, member of the Executive Committee of Asian Pacific Association of Pennsylvania. We have Jimmy Chong, who is a solo practitioner at the Chong Law Firm. Um, he's also very active in doing pro bono work for various nonprofit organizations. And we have Min Su, I get that. And um, she's a partner at, Ro at Fox Rothschild. Uh, where she's a management side employment attorney, and um, she's also served as the uh, on the D Pennsylvania Disciplinary Board. So I'm going to turn it over to JB, who's going to be the moderator. Uh, thanks. Uh, I am JB. I'm a 3L and an Apalsta, and I first, you know, thank again the panelists for coming to uh, for the symposium, and then second, I guess before we start, just to make sure everybody's cell phone is off or on buzz mode, so we don't have any interruptions. But uh, for, um, you know, I'll start with Jimmy, and then we'll move down. But uh, just a short introduction: what type of law you practice? How long you've been practicing? Where you practice? So, sure, sure. Again, uh, my name is Jimmy Chong, and um, I'm a solo practitioner. I have an office here in Wilmington, and one in Philadelphia. Uh, I graduated Widener in 2006 with a hut. Um, my practice is, I would say, <clears throat> primarily, I, I would say I do 60% uh, personal injury, you know, the, the typical personal injury, and then I do 30, 35% of biz, general business issues, business transactions, um, breach of contract claims, and so forth. And then I'll throw in a little criminal here and there just, just, to, just for fun. Um, but you know, it's just, that's basically it, you know, not too much excitement over the civil practitioner end. Um, Raha? Sure. Um, thank you again. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Sean, for inviting us here. Um, so as, um, as as Sean was saying, my name is Raha Babar. Uh, currently I'm working at the Attorney General's Office in New Jersey. Um, on the civil side, so what we, uh, the particular work that I'm doing is really defending the state with agencies, with employees, 
and against any of all claims that you can sue the state for, which apparently in New Jersey is a lot. Um, and one thing I should, I should say, I've been instructed or asked to do so. Um, all of my opinions, I'm sure this is understood anyway, but all of my opinions here today, of course, are all in my own opinions and not the opinions of the Attorney General of New Jersey. Uh, but with that said, it's a very, very busy litigation process, um, primarily. I probably, my split would be at this point, 70 to 80% trial litigation, and the rest is uh, on appeals, both in state and federal court. Hi. Thanks for coming tonight. Hopefully, what I have to say is add to um, you know, the, the value of your education and who you are now. Um, I graduated in 1995, and back when I graduated in 95, the legal market was really doing bad. Um, horrible. I mean, I, I, but I think it's worse worse today than ever, and I know that some of you will entertain the idea of going uh, in, and starting your own practice, so I think today's discussion may be highly relevant. Um, I um, practice law at Fox Rothschild. I've been there for about four years. Before that, I was at Will Smith. Um, before that, I was at Mark Evans and Kaplan. I jumped around a little bit um, in the span of 15 years, and I um, started out doing um, bankruptcy law. I thought it was the um, perfect mix of transactional law as well as litigation, and I thought that would, that would be interesting enough and uh, you know, that I could do both litigation and transactional law. But it turned out that it was not the kind of law that I wanted to do, so I started to do uh, commercial litigation at Mark Evans and Kaplan. And essentially I was in a conference room for about eight months doing document review not what I envisioned when I said I'm, I'm going to be a litigator. That was a reality check. You know, you think I'm going to go to court, I'm going to argue, argue cases, I'm going to, you know, that's not the case, you know. So when there was an opportunity for me to do immigration work, um, I grabbed it. I thought it would be something different. I thought it would give me an opportunity to grow my own practice as well as um, perhaps represent people who are underrepresented. Get into how it is so true, and I sort of fell into it. But I obviously appreciate what I do, and um, I'm going to continue to do it until I think things better come to an end. No, <laughs> no I, I'm, I'm entrenched in it. I, I often refer to it as an expert, and I take great pride in, 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 in what I do. So. All right. Um, what initially the format was, we let the speakers talk for about 40. Based on some questions I had, but because it's such a close or small group, um, felt like it was more. If you guys have questions, you know, just let them speak, and then if you guys have a question, just throw it, you know, raise your hand, throw it out there, and I'm sure they're, you know, willing to answer it. I think it's better that way instead of waiting until the end for a question and answer session. So the first question that um, I have is, as, as a practicing attorney, how have uh, each of you interacted with minorities or minority clients, or whether you know? during the legal practice, and then, because we started with Jimmy, let's start with Mary first. Okay. Um, most of my clients at Fox Rothschild are corporate clients, and, and how does corporate clients come into immigration contracts or employment disputes, right? And my clients are international clients that have offices throughout the world, and they, um, when uh, I help, they assist with mobilizing people worldwide. So it's inbound and outbound immigration, as well as taking care of executive contracts, employment contracts, and terminating and, and um, repatriating issues. So um, that's what I do. And in that context, I deal with highly sophisticated clients who, um, who, who are well-versed in the shopping for attorneys. You know, they don't really, they don't necessarily look at individual attorney, but perhaps they they look at the reputation of the law firm um, and our expertise as a group. So in that context, I don't necessarily deal with minority clients. Where I do come, come and interact with, um, with minority clients is that I do a lot of pro bono work. Um, 
not out of requirement of law, which we do have a requirement, we have to do at least 50 hours of work in a year. It's a lot, um, it's, it's mandatory. Uh, so I fulfill that requirement and then some, not because you know, it's required of me because it's, 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 it's what I wanna do. Um, and, and so, and because of my Korean background, I tend to assist Korean clients, um, Korean people in the community. And they, um, they tend to be really, um, they, their, their first time experience with lawyers or the legal system, so they're not as sophisticated. They, the system they're familiar with is from back home, let's say in, in this case it's in Korea, is very different from that of Korea in the US. So that, in that context, that's, that's when I interact with the question, yeah? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, actually, my answer would be very similar to Min's. Um, my, of course, my practice with the government is really with institutional and governmental clients. Um, with that said, we also in represent individuals who may or may not be persons of color. Um, so I would have to say that with my day job, at least, uh, the cultural implications with representing clients don't come up very often. I probably would say it came up maybe once or twice where a cultural awareness would benefit the representation. Um, and actually I have one case where um, the adversary, um, my adversary, who, or I guess the client, the plaintiff who was suing the state, um, he was, if I remember correctly, he was of a Chinese descent. Um, and some, some of those issues came up uh, during the course of litigation. Uh, but. And, but, but honestly, most of my I guess, activities as it relates to persons of color really stem from my volunteering activities with the Bar Association, uh, the Asian, Asian Pacific American Bar Association out of Philadelphia, um, where we, well, the committee that actually Jimmy and I are part of, the Community Outreach Committee, for the past couple of years, we've been making some uh, inroads, or trying to make inroads into various communities within Philadelphia, sort of a legal outreach uh, type effort where we try to educate um, educate and spread the word about certain areas of the law that we believe uh, from our own experiences within the community have um, that we've seen that there has been a need um, for for example family law domestic violence um, <clears throat> small business there's a lot of individuals with small businesses uh, sort of and immigration of course is always a hot topic um, so one of the projects that we have been doing um, is really trying to outreach with the community. Um, but for, personally for me, since I work for the government, I can't engage in the private practice of law outside of my job. So my pro bono activities is really probably more volunteer activities um, that isn't in the traditional legal sense. Um, and then of course, we, we, I could probably get into this later. Um, I don't know if most of you are aware of the, South, the Philadelphia school district situation um, the past few months, um, or actually in the past number of months, uh, there have been instances where students and, and what it believes to be students of Asian descent have been targeted by other students um, and what it appears to be because of their race. And the Bar Association has been very involved in trying to come to address the issue, what are the causes, and hopefully come to a resolution with the school district. So. Right, and <clears throat> as for me in my practice, um, it, it's my own practice, so I can really do anything I want to do. And I would say my client base, I would say about 30% of my client base are Asian Ameri Asian, Asian Americans, 60% uh, are African Americans, and 10% are the majority or the rest. So uh, most of my practice, I deal with quote unquote minorities. Um, when speaking about Asian Americans, it's um, since I am Asian, and like Min had, had said, that they, they come to America and they have you know, they, they don't know the language, you know, they're not strong in English, they don't know the legal system, and it's intimidating for them. And when they see me, they see an Asian face, even if it's, you know, a Chinese, or I'm of Korean descent as, as well as men, even if it's Chinese or Japanese, they feel a sense of, of comfort with me. And um, I think that is a benefit for me in my practice, obviously, but I can help ease them into the legal system. I can explain to them you know, what's going on, they can trust me a little more. I, I feel like they can have that comfort and trust with me, and that's why they, you know, they've approached me, and, um, you know, they, they do mention that, and they smile, and they, they thank, they thank me because I'm Asian. Um, 
which is kind of strange. But, uh, <laughs> but it, you know, so that is kind of my experience with, you know, Asians. And, and I guess when dealing with at the African-American community, um, it just, I'm not quite sure how or why I, I, the majority of my clients are from that community, but it just, it's kind of happened and word of mouth and so forth. So, uh, you know, I, I guess I, I was lucky there as well. But just like Rahat and Min, my, um, I do a lot of stuff outside of the law firm. And as Min states that she does a lot of work with the Korean community, I do as well. If you can see, I you know work with the Korean Community Center, the Korean Crime Prevention, the Korean Census. So a lot of it is dealing with that community. And um, <clears throat> it's great you know, as attorneys to be able to do that. We're, when you become an attorney, you're in a position of of power, you really are. You have, a, you know, that piece of paper will give you that power. It doesn't make you better than anyone, smarter than anyone, but it gives you that ability to go into court. It gives you that ability to, to have the power. And by having that power, you really do have to give back to your communities. And that's why I do pick the Korean communities, because growing up, you know, my parents, I was born and raised here. My parents came over here. They couldn't speak the language. They, they couldn't really assimilate that well and they needed help and I would see that they would go through so many trials and tribulations and for us to go and help these communities I think it is, a, is a great help and for you guys in the future when you become attorneys you know that's something that I hope that you guys would take upon yourself as well because it really is a, gives you a, self, a sense of satisfaction but you really are making a difference in you know these other um, other people's lives that really do need that help. As you know, Min mentioned, um, there's a perception that uh, minorities have of the legal system. They're not as, or they don't have as much knowledge. They're not familiar with it. And you know, Rahat and Jimmy, you said part of the community outreach program. There's, you know, you are out there, but there, there is a perception. And I was wondering what, as your experience, you know, like what you see, the, the perception that minorities have of the legal system. Do they? I feel like they're not as willing to come out to, you know, speak to an attorney about things. They're, they're more likely to do it from, uh, in their own house, take care of themselves, or just. So, um, if you want to start, Jim. Well, I would say um, there are many layers of problems, probably with um, with with percep misperception or mistrust of our system, and and part of what I do is I try to educate. Consumers um, about what is it that you know what what's the legal system not just procedurally but also sometimes they don't need to know the law inside and out like you guys may have to but to just to have some sub some substantive knowledge of uh, what you know the, the subject matter is somewhat useful to them because the whole process can be incredibly daunting and and, and complex so if they if you explain to them this is what I'm doing for you. This is the process. You could expect an answer, or some people can file with the state and you know, lose inside side. We'll give you an answer at this time. Having the, uh, if you do that, I think you gain their trust as well as help them understand um, what's possible, what's not possible. And I think you have to do that whether you're representing minority clients or any clients at all. It's setting expectations with your clients. Also. Um, explaining what you're doing to your clients so they, they know what to expect and what not to expect because sometimes uh, uh, when I represent Korean clients, um, the first thing they ask me is, can you guarantee the results? Or what's the percentage um, uh, that I, I could win this case or you know, I could get an immigration benefit? You know, and I don't hedge bets and we know you're not ethically, you, know, you can't guarantee anything. But they don't know that. You know, they, and, and there's some attorneys out there who would say, oh, I guarantee you um, that you will get your green card and take their money and run. And, um, and then what happens is the back end of it, you know, they um, give a lot of money to an attorney who is a fully licensed attorney and who's incompetent. And you know, I won't get into too much of it, but you know, they, they take advantage of uh, the unsuccessful client. And what do they do in terms of um, getting their money back or filing a grievance? They don't. Uh, sometimes a lot of these folks are undocumented people. So they are afraid that if they speak up, they're going to be reported to immigration and they're going to be 
reporting. So you're dealing with a very vulnerable community. So, and, and there are plenty of rulers out there who take advantage of this. And some of them actually end up in front of their disciplinary board um, and they get disbarred or they get suspended. But the number of minority attorneys who come up, with, or attorneys who uh, represent minority attorneys, I don't see that, I don't see too many of them, but when they do come up, you know, it's after they've done some substantial damage to, to ruin our reputation, to leave a community as a whole, and, and really screw people's lives. And in the immigration context, I can tell you, it's not losing a case or a personal injury case or monetary relief. These are people's lives and people get deported, people are, families are separated, but they have some devastating consequences and, and people are affected and, and, and I, I always say, why didn't you report this to someone? responses, well, who do I go to? Or I was afraid that if I reported to the police, the first thing they'll ask me is, what's your immigration status? So part of my job really is to go out there and educate people about what, what their rights are and, and you know, explain the legal process as much as possible. So education is a key component of what I do for the government here. Um, as well as I guess Rahad and Tammy, as part of your community outreach programs that you do, do you see a lot of minorities coming to these programs to become CPU? And if they do, and when they do, you know, what do they, what is, I guess the same question is what is their perception of the legal system? You know, what do they think? Are they afraid? Are they, uh, I guess, Rahat? Well, I mean, I think then I hit the nail right on the head. I mean, it's, it's really legal, legal access. Um, I mean, I'll just speak from my limited experiences in the Philadelphia area. Legal access is a huge problem. The, the, the interactions that we've had with the community, I mean, really solidify what Min was saying. Um, they're intimidated. They don't know how it works. I mean, and, and rightly so. I mean, the government, I mean, just dealing with the government from the city on up, I mean, can be quite a daunting task. Um, and I guess uh, what we've been trying to do is hopefully dismantle that perception a little bit and try to at, at least make it a little bit more approachable as much as we can. Um, and also, I mean, and, and on one note that Min sort of touched on, uh, a, lot, a lot of what we've been saying as it relates to uh, this, the, the student violence issue, the student violence issue that we've been working on in, in the Philadelphia School District, is that a lot of these kids who are being assaulted and who are being um, um, subjected to violence, just that they're not reporting it. Um, their fear of retribution, their fear of, uh, of their immigration status, they believe that if they report it, you know, somehow immigration authorities are going to go ahead and detain them. Um, of course, and, one of that, and that's part of what we're trying to do is like, look, in Philadelphia, um, immigration status isn't a relevant concern. I believe the Philadelphia Police Department has a policy uh, saying that their officers aren't allowed to ask about your uh, immigration status because their purpose, I mean, and I believe the Pennsylvania State Police uh, um, maintain the same position because their, their, their purpose is to safeguard the community. Um, undocumented people are part of the community, whether we like it or not. Um, and so, uh, trying to get that message across, um, it's a very, it's a difficult. I mean, it, it, it's it's it has been a difficult task, but hopefully we can try to make some inroads. Um, but no, but absolutely. I mean, I think there's that intimidation factor. Um, just generally, they're just af afraid. So hopefully, if that's one of the things we've been trying to do is just kind of get out there. It's like, look, there's no need to be afraid. Um, you, if your family's in danger, you need to talk to somebody about it. I guess to kind of piggyback on that a little bit is, um, <clears throat> and again my, again, my experience is mostly dealing with Asian Americans, um, just because of my background. Uh, a lot of Asian Americans do not go to uh, you know the authorities or, or deal with the legal system. And one is because they, they fear or they don't understand it, but also they feel like it's a, it's a waste of time. They feel that because when they go and they speak to someone who, who doesn't know their language, and obviously, you know, the, the older Asian community cannot express themselves that well in English, that they get kind of pushed to the side, they get put, you know, kind of brushed under the rug, so they say, um, and that that does happen. I can I kind of understand that, you know, when these government entities, they're, I mean, they're overwhelmed. You talk to Rahad himself, I mean, he, just talking before coming out here, he was just telling me how he just nonstop work. He couldn't even really take a day off when he was sick, and, in bed, um, and and that's like it for everywhere in these government entities. So, 
you know, attorneys that can help out the communities, kind of help out, kind of teach and educate, like Min was saying, what does really help and will help them kind of, you know, we could speak to these, uh, um, these minority groups and kind of help them verbally express themselves when they do go, or we can, you know, express their, you know, their issues for them. Um, you know, this is kind of what we do in our outreach programs, and, and uh, it's, it, it is very effective, but we have to show our face and we have to be known a little more. Um, I know back, I would say a year ago, there was a lot of um, home invasions on Asians. Uh, and the, the reason they would say is one, Asians had a lot of money, a lot of cash, and two, that they would not go to the police. And you know, to tell you the truth, that, that it was somewhat true. Um, you know, I, I know, you know my parents, they had some issues and they wouldn't go to the authorities because when they did, the authorities wouldn't wouldn't have the patience to deal with them because they couldn't speak English well, and and uh, it's unfortunate, it's a fact. But with you know these outreach communities and and other attorneys putting their time in and doing some pro bono work, I think things will change. And as our generation gets older, and we can help you know be a face and represent our you know minority um, different classes, I think it you know be a benefit. So I mean, not to put words in your mouth, but it seems like it's not more than just a, I guess, a fear of, of, uh, of uh, the profession, of the legal system. I mean, it's just the, I guess, the authority body, like reporting who needs to support the authority, like the school district, even for the kids to just report it to the principal or the teacher. I guess it would be diff difficult for them to do it, just because maybe they don't think that anything's going to come of it. Exactly. So, yep. Definitely. Exactly. Um, Can I ask the audience something? Are you guys third years, second years? Yeah. And are you thinking about going on your own and open up your own practice eventually when you graduate? Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, can I just say, tell you something that's been maybe relevant to you? Because um, we're talking about pro bono work, outreach. Well, you need to make money, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, pro bono lawyers. And the, way, the one way you can make a difference is this. Obviously, you know, you, you'll hopefully you'll you'll end up representing um, your minority clients. You know, and one thing you can do is is not only you know demystifying the uh, legal process, but also being able to work because there's no substitute for providing excellent legal um, legal services. And the one thing about minority clients is this: if you do an excellent job, right, for one client, that one client is going to be your best. Telling their neighbors, friends, and family, "Hey, I used, you know, so and so, and he did an excellent job. He didn't cheat me out of my money, and he explained the entire process to me. It was amazing. And guess what? His friends will, or her friends will tell their friends about it. And all of a sudden, you're representing a sec, a, a huge sector of um, the private sector they're, they're referring work to. And at times, you know, when you're, uh, when you have a lot of clients." You back by providing good services pro bono work to um, some of these communities that are desperately in need of good representation. So, you know, we all have that responsibility of being a good lawyers, whether you're representing corporate clients, you know, minority clients, or whatever clients you're representing, pro bono clients or paying clients, you know, don't undermine the importance of doing your job of, you know, providing good legal services. I mean, you can probably look at me like, do you have a giver? Well, it's actually not a giver because <laughs> I've seen plenty of instances where it, it's not done. Okay. When I joined, um, when I served actually on the Pennsylvania Disciplinary Board for three years, the first thing I noticed was this. They have a, um, a pamphlets and, and the internet um, information about how to report uh, bad lawyers, right? It's all written in English. Great if you speak English and you can read and write, but what about clients who cannot read? Unfortunately, there are a lot of us out there, we, you know, English is a second language, we don't speak English at all. So I, um, one of the things that, that I did, and I'm very proud of, was um, putting the pamphlet in a second language, Spanish would be the first, and you're gonna talk, they're probably gonna um, read other languages soon, but Spanish would be the first thing, if um, you have to start somewhere, and it's a large population, a non-speaking population you have to start with. So um, we all, 
really the Lord informs that David expressed um, in um, making a difference. That's the story he told us to make a difference. Um, before I go, I have a couple more questions, but I mean, if anybody from the audience wants to jump in on anything we spoke of, or if you have if you're thinking about something, you know, if you have a question for anyone, you know, feel free to raise your hand. When you're talking about uh, fully understand. Can you uh, rephrase? Like you were saying uh, earlier that a lot of people may not report because the fear uh, the afraid of their immigration status. I just wonder, I guess, going about being deported if they're, if they're found out that they're not here legally. Right. Um, do you think if that was just taken out of the equation, that that would eliminate it, or is it more than just that? I, I think it's more than just that. I think a lot, and in, in, in certain areas of our communities, that, that part of it has been eliminated. I mean, we have uh, local governmental policies that, I mean, directing their their employees, their agents, that look, immigration status, whether someone's documented or not, isn't a relevant consideration whether or not this person was beat up by their spouse. Um, and on top of that, I mean, and also um, one thing I think that it's, it's, which I think we need to do a better job, and it's like, especially in the immigration context, is the U visa uh, or for domestic violence victims, whether regardless of your well, I don't know the details. I shouldn't say too much on it. But uh, regardless of the immigration status, you can obtain temporary status as your domestic violence uh, case is being litigated in court. Um, so uh, again, there's another avenue for a victim, uh, uh, at least in the domestic violence context, uh, to obtain status here in the, in the United States. But no, I think uh, I think that's part of it. But also beyond that is is what Jimmy and Mimi are talking about is the language access issue. Um, is, is, the, is these issues of really how to approach the legal system in general. And that in and of itself is intimidating. Um, and so hopefully, I, I think that's part of it. I, I think that's true. If we take that consideration out of the picture, it helps in approaching these communities. But I think it's, it's, a, it's more than just that. I think it's just a component of it. I think even if they became naturalized US citizens and naturalized to bring her, I think they still don't know the legal process. They don't know their rights. Um, they don't know what kind of legal access they have out there. And it could be an economic factor as well. Sure, you know, you need a lawyer to do something, but how much is it going to cost me? You know, they may not have the, the fees to pay to hire an attorney. So um, that may be another factor. Okay. I guess going with Rob's question, is it is it more of a, um, a cultural Thing where they where certain minority clients might not realize like you said their rights um, does that come from I mean I don't really know much about I'm not an expert on Asian American culture but is it is it the focus because maybe wherever that particular client comes from that specific right not be is it, 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 it held to the same level that it is here and for example, I was thinking like First Amendment, you know, free speech issues, things like other along those na in that nature, maybe more so than the criminal context, because clearly, you know, you get your windows get shot out or something like that. Of course, you know, you know your rights when it comes to that. You know, you can always go to the police. But if you're being told not to wear a certain color in the on a public school, they might not realize the extent that you have that freedom here in our country, which is sort of, I mean, the way I look at it, it's something that the United States stands for in, in that type of respect. Is that something that you see a lot? I especially think that maybe, Jimmy, you'd be able to speak more well, on this. I, I, think it, it, I think you did kind of hit, uh, hit the nail on the head that it is cultural as well, because um, some cultures they do things differently and some things are accepted in certain cultures um, so they wouldn't see it as a violation but there's I guess to go a little further than that is maybe say there's a domestic violence incident that does happen you know in some cultures that would be embarrassing and they would be they would be shameful in their in their cultures they, they would not go and they would not report that and they would just deal with it and you know culturally that's the way it was in the past so they think, well, we're over here. No, I really shouldn't 
one make us think about it because they're not gonna the whoever I report to won't understand me won't um, have the patience for me and I don't even know where to go and two is I don't want to embarrass myself and my family so it is cultural as well and if we can go out there and we can kind of also educate that look you know there are certain things that's right and wrong and culturally even if it was accepted in the past doesn't mean it's right to go going forward with that so you know one, one thing I always say is that you know um, in most Asian culture uh, countries um, they don't live with as much as we do we're not, we're very highly society as you may imagine um, the idea of suing someone because you fell on their property is probably obscene to my parents okay whereas you know if someone fell on someone's property the first thing that popped in my mind is not am I hurt oh shoot who am I going to sue they, we don't have that. I mean, they don't have that mentality wherever they're coming from. But, you know, um, somebody might be rightfully hurt on, on, on a job or on someone's property because they didn't maintain it properly and there's some negligence on their part. Um, they think it's their fault. They didn't work for the person. If they're hurt on the job, you know, they, um, they don't know what their rights are. They think they're limited to perhaps workers' compensation um, when they – they may be able to go beyond that if the, you know, the company that, uh, I don't know the work comp law that well, but well, that you know, they could go beyond it and, and get more than what the company is offering. But they don't know any of this. Sometimes, you know, the migrant um, uh, Hispanic workers are hired to do work um, something that um, they get hurt, not because um, they were, the workers were negligent necessarily, but because the poor working hazardous conditions that, that's you know, evident in the workplace. And they think if they're hurt, they have no recourse and they walk away from it. And some of these people have their hands chopped off, you know, they fall from you know, a building and they get seriously ill. And they, um, they don't think they, they should be reported because one, immigration actually can come into effect, you know, because, because a lot of these unscrupulous employers will say, yeah, go ahead and sue me and I'll, ha I'll be deported. So they just quietly go ahead. So, you know, there's a lot of that. Well, for me, I, there is somewhat, I think more of it's an educational di difference. Um, when I deal with minorities that are higher, you know, have higher education, and regardless of when they came over here, they're, they're, they know more, so they can go and they'll understand and learn about what the, how the legal system works here. However, if they're not as educated and they're just, you know, coming here, they're working you know minimal paying jobs and just trying to make it and so forth they the, the trust is not there because they're not educated they don't know so um, as I guess the generations if it's generations coming from uh, you know other countries into the the US no it's more educational but if it's you know generational where you know your parents came from a different country you're here and then your kids are here and then they do, they would have more trust in the system or more they would know the system more, not have more trust. They would know the system more to go ahead and go forward with what they need to do, talk to authorities, get a, an attorney. Um, so it's somewhat generational, somewhat educational, just based on what type of minority we're speaking about, in my experience. Thank you. 
strategy, and they come to me because they want to uh, file a complaint against the attorney and I help them with that process. So I said, how did you find this attorney? And he said, well, I found him on the front page of the book. <laughs> he must be good. So talk about um, educating us and, and like they said, I mean, if they have money, they can go to a, a home directory and hire the most expensive attorney they can find. But there's so many free legal services available that they just have no idea talk about generation differences now. Some people come from another um, country, but they're so internet savvy. They come to me and they have all the answers. They just want to verify with me. <laughs> so it's, it's knowledge, it's education, it's sophistication, it's money, and everything that you know, comes with that. And, and, but in terms of outreach, there's so much more and even on, and just on that note, I think one of the things that we've been trying to do uh, with the community outreach, having with the community, community outreach committee with the Asian American Bar is really going out and and getting in touch with different communities within the Asian community. Um, and sort of, and not only do we offer like free seminars on various legal topics, but we also sort of I think, and this is what we're slowly getting towards within the bar association, sort of acting as a clearinghouse um, of lawyers. And while the bar association itself uh, doesn't have the facilities or the resources to really represent individual clients, but at, at the very least, what we are trying to do is at least point them in the right direction. Uh, if someone needs a family law attorney, we can, we have contacts. We can try to refer them to um, X attorney or Y attorney. Uh, if they need a discounted rate, we'll talk. Um, pro bono, again, we'll try to see what we can do. Um, but I think exactly one of the things is not with the legal access issue of it. Um, it's really where do they go? And do they go in front of the book or do, can they go to different bar associations with legal services or community legal services in Philadelphia and trying to get a, 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 at least a, a credible, not credible, but a competent attorney that can represent them? One thing that um, I, I work with the Korean American Census Committee and one thing we're doing is to try and teach the, the community about the census, and hopefully you, you guys all know about the census, is that um, you know, what we do is we, we have an office that we, we rent out. It's, at, it's called an H-Mart, and that's where a lot of the Korean community will go, and we have it right center on the second floor by the food court. We're open 9 to 7, and it's just different volunteers spending their time there. We also um, you know, raise enough money so we're handing um, – pamphlets out to all the Korean churches in the community. We're leaving them in all the Korean grocery stores. We actually spend, you know, we had a kickoff party at a Korean restaurant. We would spend time handing out t-shirts and, and pa informational pamphlets, mugs, everything. And that's one way that, you know, we're really trying to push the Korean community to really learn, hey, look, the census is very important. It's important to the community, everyone to fill out. Doesn't matter if, you know, you're, you know, an illegal immigrant or undoc undoc undocumented immigrant, or if you know, it, you know, it won't affect your status. They won't anything you fill out. It's not going to affect anything down the road. And to do, I think we as attorneys have to really not just kind of sit back, but really put our face into the community and really push the legal educate the education about the legal services out there. And then that's how the community will learn about what they, what legal rights they do and do not have. Um, I guess the last question we can go is, um, I don't want to say difficulty, but what are some differences between representing a minority client as opposed to a non-minority client or dealing with a non-minority client versus, or dealing with a non-minority person as opposed to a minority person? I think throughout my presentation, I kind of just sort of, sort of touched upon For me, I will tell you, not only um, do I deal with some you know, not overt racism at work place, but I do sometimes feel like I miss out of um, opportunities at the firm. And I'm not targeting my law firm, but it's, it's sort of everywhere. Um, you know, there's a client pitch, I'm, I'm left out. Um, it does happen, but it's, it's you know, probably sexism and racism that I They look at me like, well, I was hoping to see a male attorney. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and, and my Korean clients sometimes I would say, I was hoping for a Jewish attorney because I heard they're, they're the best. I, I kid you not. <laughs> like, wow, okay. <laughs> you, you know, you agree with 
Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> so, and, and they're not even very, um, uh, they're very, uh, it's, I, th I think it's part Korean culture that they, they don't even sugarcoat it. They just come out and say it. Mm -hmm. right? So that, that's some of the, I guess, difficulties I think mm -hmm. of, of our time. And also, um, not speaking the language fully can be a huge um, um, obstacle. With, with, with representing. Like yeah, whether I'm representing the Spanish speaking clients, because I don't, you know, I, I don't speak English really well. Korean, eh, you know, Spanish I could understand. But in order to represent someone effectively, you have to communicate well. And that's, that's, that's actually a huge problem. Getting someone who can translate and interpret it um, uh, competently. That, that I think, because I, I said in the immigration proceeding, I, I'm, I'm in the back of the room, and there's a court certified translator translating. And with my limited knowledge, I kind of knew that the, the interpreter was not doing a good job. Yeah. <laughs> Missing a lot of, just making up answers. And that's a, that's a huge problem. And Pennsylvania court has actually um, has done some studies to see how they can improve the court system. And that was a huge um, portion of it of how are the ch court translators and interpreters, are they effective translating and um, interpreting their clients for them. So that's, uh, that's some of the, I guess, mm -hmm. difficulties of the language barrier yeah. and some of these issues. But I think representing clients is, it's like pulling teeth. I think sometimes I say, you know, you have to go to the police and report this. No, I don't want to. What are my other options? <laughs> them into doing things that are very uncomfortable for them. Um, I represented a woman recently who she was being physically abused by her husband and because he was her sponsor to be here in this country um, as a US citizen, she thought that if she went to the police, that means she's on her way back to her country. And I kept telling her that's not the case. And you know, just recently she was looking for me because Sometimes you love to pick and choose high-paying corporate clients, but you're, if you go on your own, you you will end up representing um, clients who are the ones we just described for you. And having this knowledge hopefully will be helpful to you in, in knowing what you have to do. It, it's gaining trust in in any relationship. I think that's you know that's um, important, but especially representing the Korean clients, knowing the difference. Actually, I was going to say, I was going to take the flip side of that. And Jimmy and I, we were talking about this before the panel today, is that sometimes even culture may not even make a difference at all in, with your legal representation. As you were saying, if you do a good job, you do a good job. And if you get the result they want, well, that's all that matters. Um, so in, in many cases, um, the, the, whether the client is a person of color or not, whether, uh, whether there's uh, culture implications or not, um, in, many, in many, many cases, it just doesn't matter. Um, but I would say this, on the, on going back to the other side of the coin, um, is that, I, I, I'll, I actually I'll just say one quick example. When I was interning back in London um, with a firm, um, strangely enough, I was tagged with um, a client of ours who, who's being charged by the government, well, there it's the Crown, it's the Queen who brings the prosecution. Uh, the Crown bringing a, a, a charges against the client for blackmail and theft. And I won't go into all the backstory, but, it was, uh, but the client itself, he was a young kid, 18 to 20 years old. Um, he's, he was from Bangladesh, where my family's from. Um, and he had very limited knowledge in English, in, in English, and he was very scared. And he didn't know what was going on. Why is he being charged? 
uh, why is the government after him? Uh, he's facing jail time. Um, I don't think my firm knew that I was, my family was from Bangladesh, but somehow they tagged me to this case and asked me to help out with the clients. Um, but of course, lo and behold, we were able to discover a common language and my, with my limited Bengali um, skills, we were able to um, really bridge a lot of the, um, a lot of the misconceptions, a lot of, a lot of his fears uh, with facing uh, the criminal justice system in London. Uh, so I think in, in that way, um, yeah, knowing, knowing your client and knowing where they're coming from and their fears uh, is all part of being a lawyer. And of course, in many cases, you may not learn that in law school, um, but of course, that's why they call it the practice of law. I have to agree with everything that Minin Rahad has, sa has said. Basically, um, when you get a client, you do you know different cultural things. You know, if you know one client, I'll shake their hand; other client, I'll bow. You know, one client, I'll hand things with my right hand; another client, it won't matter. You know, those little subtle differences and, and getting to know your client. But it doesn't even to be a good lawyer, you have to really know how to deal with your client. It doesn't matter if it, they're a minority, if it's cultural, if it's just when your client is a loon and you have to really learn how to deal with them and control them. Um, you know, I, that's what I've learned the most in my practice is I've dealt with some really just strange people and I've learned how to really control them and, and kind of give them the answers that they want to hear but in a way that it's telling the truth and how to handle them. Um, what it comes down to, like Min and Ron said, you just have to do a good job. And if it's a minority, non-minority, white, black, red, green, I, I don't care. I'm going to get the job done and do it right. Um, just those little subtle differences you may have to take in consideration. But when it comes down to it, it's all about the facts in front of you and how to deal with them. So. Um, I guess we have like a couple minutes left. Um, and on the other hand, having a solo practice is a business of your own. So how do you juggle the two and how do you manage everything because you have issues of payroll, you have billing, you have to collect monies, you have all those other aspects that go with running a business. So how, how do you manage the time? I mean, any insights? Do you get like, do you outsource anything or? How does one do all that? It, it all depends on your personality and what you can do. I, I try not to outsource just because outsourcing, again, you're paying another bill to someone else to do it. Um, it it's just a lot of work. You just have to be very organized. Um, and that's one of my weaknesses. I try to be organized, but um, you just really have to be on top of things. Uh, there's no real secret to it, except it just takes a lot of work organization and you just have to know yourself and how you get things done and that's what you know kind of what I learned in law school is how to balance and juggle what I want to do and people do things different it's like studying you know people some people use outlines some people don't it's kind of the same way just kind of I know it's a kind of a bad answer and how you want to hear but you have to know what your best assets are in terms of juggling and what priorities if in the morning you need to pay the bills first or if you wait till the end of the day when to make phone calls um, you know, when to go do your marketing. It just, you just have to kind of get a sense of your own feeling. It took me, I would say, a good year to really kind of get to a point where I'm comfortable in what I'm doing right now. And then the next thing is now it's time to expand and then you have to kind of do it all over again. You have two offices and also that increases it even more and then you have yeah. Actually, you know, as a, a you know, solo practitioner, you know, not many, I, I guess I'm in court, but I'm not in trial. Not many cases go to trial, but I'm in court here, I'm in court there, but it's, you know, it's, you know, you're in arbitration, but it's something that's, you know, it's doable. Um, it's, don't go into, a lot of attorneys are afraid to start their own practice because they're afraid, they think they're not going to be able to handle it, but just take baby steps, don't, you know, over commit here or there, but it's not as difficult as, as it seems, you know? Just take a deep breath and you'll get through it. It's like the bar exam. You guys will start freaking out about it, but it's not that bad once you really just, you know, take a deep breath. Can I just say something about solo practitioners? Um, while I served on the disciplinary board, the common um, case that I saw before the board was this. 
Turning to the fall practitioners who commingle funds, escrow and business operations and accounts together. And when I saw that, it, was, it wasn't because they were trying to cheat or you know, embezzle money from clients. It was just purely sloppiness, lack of time, lack of resources, or not knowing the rules. That you can't commingle the funds in the tree. Probably the law teaches you that, but maybe they don't. And it, you know, I didn't have to deal with any of that because luckily I work for a firm where they have a whole accounting department and when the check comes in, they took, take care of it. But when you're on your own, you have to deal with accounting, you have to deal with marketing person, everything else. So if you're overwhelmed, you have to get help. You know, sure, it costs money, but at the end of the day, you'll be happy that somebody is helping you with accounting. It's math is not your strong suit. And imagine what I do. <laughs> That's why you're asking. Um, so, you know, and another thing that I saw is that the solo practitioners is that they get overwhelmed. And you say, take a deep, deep, big breath. But here's the thing you make small mistakes, a lot of these guys are like that, attorneys, and they, instead of admitting they made a mistake and coming forward with it, they try to cover it up and it just snowballs into a place where it's unfixable and they are suspended from the practice of law. And, and it wasn't until I actually served on the board that I really realized the importance of my job and the license to practice law. And you know, I think Jamie said something about having power. I, I, I felt more like it was a responsibility. You know, what would I do without my, my law license? At this point, we're just about out of time. So if you have any questions, we can <coughs> hold that for our reception. Um, but at this time, I just want to thank the panelists again for coming here tonight. And um, we certainly welcome you to our reception, which is right outside um, our, uh, the Vail Mood Courtroom. So just thank you again for coming. Thank you.